Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you at our Wednesday evening Bible class. We are headed for Exodus chapter 12 tonight, so we want to invite you to be turning together with us to Exodus chapter 12. We'll be there in just a few moments. If you have any questions, any comments, or feedback concerning tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. You can also send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. We are back to the book of Exodus tonight. So Exodus chapter 12 is where we are. This is one of the most important chapters anywhere in the Old Testament. And so tonight we come to really what is a turning point in the history of God's people. So Exodus chapter 12, we've just finished looking at the first nine plagues, and we are now ready for plague number 10. And this is the chart that I introduced last week. If you were with us, you may remember this, just giving us an overview or an outline of the 10 plagues. We have the plagues listed on the left-hand side, and then on the right we have just a few highlights, anything especially interesting or memorable from each of the plagues. Uh, feel free to screenshot this if you are interested. If you can do that, I'd also be willing to send this out by email if that would help also. I've noted that the first two were duplicated by the Egyptian magicians, while the third was declared by the Egyptians to, uh, by the Egyptians to have come from the finger of God. So they were really impressed with number three. This is far and beyond what they were capable of doing. And I noted on the chart here that the Israelites were exempted from the plague, starting with the fourth one, which is significant. They do not suffer the rest. And I've noted that the magicians actually flee Pharaoh's court during the plague of boils, number six. And I've noted how uh, Pharaoh offers several compromises that are rejected by Moses along the way. And then we've got the tenth plague on here, even though we technically haven't seen it happen yet. But we are headed there tonight, but hopefully the chart is helpful in some way. Let me know if you have any additions or corrections to this, and I'd be glad to make those updates. So let's jump back into it tonight, picking up with Exodus chapter 12. And the first paragraph is Exodus 12, verses 1 through 13. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt." Well, up in verse 1, God informs Moses and Aaron that what is about to happen will be so significant that it will reset their entire calendar as a nation. So forget any arrangement of days, any months, years, any special celebrations that you've had up to this point, because everything starts over right now. This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. In other words, based on what God is about to do, this month will now be January, as we would say today. This is now New Year's. This is so significant. 
He goes on to explain that on the 10th of the month, each family is to take a lamb from the flock. If your family is uh, too small to justify an entire lamb, you are to go in with your neighbors on this. This is to be a community effort. You need to work together on this. And so there is to be some cooperation. This is getting together as a nation really to get this done. And this will continue on down through the centuries. But they are to take this lamb into their household on the 10th of the month. And I want us to notice that they are to keep it in their household until the 14th day of the month. And I don't know whether we've thought about this, but this makes the sacrifice pretty personal, doesn't it? When you take a lamb into your home for four days, I've never done this, but I'm assuming that it almost becomes a part of the family, almost like a, a pet. It is a lamb. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it this year. I've made it several years. i got a lot going on this weekend. I'm heading out of town. But some of you may know that there is the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival happening this weekend. I think maybe Thursday is when they get set up and Friday, Saturday, Sunday over at the county fairgrounds in Jefferson, Wisconsin, about half an hour, 45 minutes straight east of us here in Madison. And it is an interesting get-together. A bunch of shepherds get together, a bunch of people with wool, yarn, and everything involved with that. An amazing thing to get together to see all of those sheep and the lambs. They have a barn dedicated to lambs and a section of that barn dedicated to newborn lambs. And what a, an amazing thing that is. I know in today's society, a lot of us are pretty uh, separated. We're cut off from uh, seeing animals grow on a regular basis, and we're kind of distant from that. So if you can make it over to the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival this weekend, I would uh, highly recommend it. Just an amazing thing to do. Uh, the Crook and Whistle Nationals are a highlight to me, where the shepherds get out there with their sheep dogs, and they have their dogs drive. I don't know if you drive sheep. I would say they drive sheep across a field and around certain barriers, and then they turn around, the dog brings them back, and the dog is controlled with whistles uh, from the uh, shepherd, various tones, pitches, and uh, and links, and so on. So neat thing to see if you can do that. I would highly recommend it. But I'm just saying they are to bring a lamb into their home on the 10th of the month, and then they are to sacrifice it on the 14th. So they have three or four days, depending on how you cut that down, how you look at that, that they are living with this little lamb in their home. So it's personal. And it seems like God intends it to be that way. It is not some distant sacrifice that you never see. This is personal. Well, according to verse 6, each family is to kill its lamb at twilight, so as the sun is going down, and they are to take its blood. They are to smear it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of each house. Today, we would say around the doorframe. And then they are to eat the meat of the lamb roasted over fire, so not boiled, not raw, but roasted along with bitter herbs. They are to eat it right there on the spot with no leftovers. Anything that they don't eat, it is to be destroyed by fire. They are to leave no trace of it because they are to be on their way out of the nation. And the reason is here, they are leaving. This is the first to-go meal, the first drive through type meal, we might say, in the Bible. They are to eat it on their way out the door. And they are to eat this meal with their loins girded. I hope we notice that there, of course... They would often wear robes, they would have some kind of a belt or a rope around their waist, and to gird the loins would be to pick up those robes and to tuck them into the belt to make it easier to run. So they are to eat the meal with their loins girded, with their sandals on their feet, with their staff in their hand. So eat with one hand, have your staff in the other. And they are to eat it very quickly. In verse 12 he explains this is the Lord's Passover which means that God himself will strike down all the firstborn in Egypt. He is executing judgment on all the gods of Egypt. But the blood of the doorpost, that's a sign for God to pass over that house and to move on to the next one as he kills every firstborn in the land. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I believe it was Brother Michael who uh, taught us a song with these words several years ago, and we do still sing it from time to time, but this is the Passover. These are the basics of it. So let's continue tonight with Exodus chapter 12, moving along to verses 14 through 20. Exodus 12, verses 14 through 20. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall, not, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. 
On the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them, except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. We learn in this passage that the Passover then is not to be just a one-time event, but it is to be an ongoing memorial, looking back at the original Passover. We also learn here that the memorial, the instruction for the memorial, it is established before the actual event takes place. And isn't that an unusual thing to consider? The memorial is established before the thing to be memorialized actually happens. Does that sound familiar? Can we think of another memorial in the Bible that was established before the thing to be memorialized actually happened? I hope we're thinking about the Lord's Supper. Of course, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26, the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, as with the Passover, so also Jesus institutes the memorial to his death on the night before he actually dies. Usually people plan memorials only after an event takes place. This is like setting up your tombstone before you're dead. But God knows that both of these events will happen. This is absolute certainty that the Passover will happen and that Jesus will die the following day in the New Testament, of course. But he makes this announcement establishing both memorials before the fact. We also see an emphasis in this passage on the unleavened bread, don't we? That's emphasized over and over again in this little paragraph. They are to remove all traces of leaven from their homes. So it's not just unleavened bread. They are to remove all leaven from the house itself. And then they are to eat the unleavened bread that they prepare. Originally, it was unleavened because they were in a hurry. So that there was a, a reasoning to this. They didn't have time to let the bread rise. Of course, God can see this before it happens. And so he has them plan on making unleavened bread. But I think there's obviously a much deeper meaning here. In the New Testament, leaven is sometimes compared to sin, isn't it? So just as yeast spreads through a lump of dough, so also sin spreads in our lives and among God's people. And so sin is compared to leaven. Um, and then we also have the unleavened bread continuing in the New Covenant in the Lord's Supper. So these two are tied together. We now have multiple connections or similarities between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. Well, let's continue tonight with Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 28. Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 28. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lentil and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall observe this rite. And when your children say to you, what does this rite mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. 
and the people bowed low and worshipped. Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Well, some of the instruction is repeated here as Moses communicates this to the elders of Israel now as he gives the actual command to the people. But there is some new information in this paragraph, isn't there? And it, it comes almost as an explanation as to why this illustration is so graphic. Notice they are to do this, not just to save themselves. Obviously, that's the main point here. But this annual remembrance is intended to be passed along to their children forever. And we see this at the end of verse 24. And he goes on to explain that when children and future generations see their parents doing this, they will ask mom and dad, what does this right mean to you? As a dad, I know, and most of you know as well, that kids ask a whole lot of questions, don't they? In fact, I feel as if I've had a 25-year chunk of my life dedicated to doing the best I can to answer questions. <laughs> and you know what? When you take a lamb into your home for four days, and then you suddenly kill it, and then you smear its blood around your front doorway, and then when you eat unleavened bread for a week or two, disrupting the family pattern of eating and drinking, kids are going to ask, why? Dad, why are we doing this? This is a strange thing. At every stage of this, in fact, kids will continually ask this, won't they? Dad, why are we doing this? And God knows that, you know, that this will provide what we would sometimes refer to today as a teachable moment. We understand what those are, I hope. In fact, there are going to be many teachable moments throughout the Passover celebration. And I would say the same thing about the Lord's Supper today. If you've ever held a small child during the Lord's Supper then you know that they will often be asking, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you eating that? Why are you drinking this? Why can't I have some of that? And they ask these questions constantly. And I believe both memorials, the Lord's Supper as well as the original Passover, were designed by God that way for a reason. I think from a teaching point of view, most of us understand that most people learn better when more of the senses are involved, so more senses involved equals uh, a higher level of learning, easier to remember things when we taste and smell and, and see and hear all combined. And this one has it all, don't we? Uh, doesn't it? Um, they see and smell the blood, they hear the, the lamb and the noises that it's making, they can taste the bread, they can taste the lamb and all of this. They can, they can feel all of this as well. It's very visual, all of the senses are involved. And now they have their dad explaining why, why all of this is so important. We do this to remember God killing the firstborn of Egypt, but sparing our family in the process. In fact, we wouldn't be here if it were not for the first Passover. By the way, I don't know how your translation of the Bible handles it throughout this chapter, but I want to just point out briefly that in the New American Standard, at least, uh, we have a reference to the destroyer. And I believe we may also have a reference to an angel of the Lord somewhere in here actually killing the firstborn. Some people will sometimes refer to the death angel. But I don't believe that term is ever used in Scripture. If I'm wrong, I hope you'll point that out. It's just something that I haven't been able to find. Maybe it's just the translations that I've checked. So it's not a huge deal, but it's obviously, I think, better to be as accurate as possible, especially as we speak of spiritual things like this. Now, we may have a song or two in our songbooks where we sing about the death angel. And with an uninspired song, I think sometimes we can allow for poetic license. I think kind of assuming the best of the author of that song, realizing that most of our songs are, are written by mere mortals. They may not be perfect in every way. So we need to allow some grace, some leeway there, as long as just outright false doctrine isn't being taught. But when we have a choice, I'm just saying, let's be careful about not referring to the death angel. This is the angel of the Lord or the destroyer. At the end of this paragraph, we have the people actually doing what God had commanded through Moses. So uh, let's continue on then with Exodus 12, verses 29 through 32. Exodus 12, 29 through 32. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all of the firstborn cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. 
Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go and bless me also. Starting in verse 29, God does exactly what he said he would do. No surprises here. He strikes all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, every firstborn, from Pharaoh to the captives to the cattle, uh, prisoners, everybody's involved here. People in the dungeons, in the throne room. Uh, Pharaoh gets up in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians. There is this great cry throughout the land of Egypt, for there's no home in which there's not someone dead. And then he calls for Moses and Aaron in the middle of the night, and he says, rise up, get out of here, go, get out from among my people. You and all the people, all the sons of Israel, go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks, your herds, as you have said, and go and bless me also. So he demands, he doesn't just allow these people to leave, but he demands that the people get out. You know, it's traumatic enough when one person dies. But can you imagine an entire nation where somebody dies, at least one person is dead in every household throughout the land? How do you even deal with something like that. So Pharaoh then is upset and he demands in his anger that the people leave. He doesn't just allow them, he drives them out. And this time, notice there is no compromise. He doesn't say, well, you can take these people, but not these people, or you can leave, but only go for two days. Nothing like that. Pharaoh finally gets it. All of you can go. And you need to go permanently. You need to go right now in the middle of the night. You know, all these were hang-ups in the previous attempts at compromise after several of those previous plagues. But now, though, he demands that the people get out of his country immediately. Notice right at the end, he tacks on a little special request. And bless me also. I don't know, it's, it's almost humorous. You know, this man probably hates God, probably hates Moses right now. He's just lost his firstborn son. But here he is asking for a blessing. I mean, this man has been completely humiliated. His nation has been decimated. He's overwhelmed with grief over the death of his son. This is personal. And he could deal with bloody water and gnats and flies and hail and all that, but this is personal. You need to get out. And then this weird little statement here at the end, bless me also. Kind of just a strange thing in my opinion, kind of an unusual little uh, request or demand, I guess we might say, tacked on here at the end. So let's continue then with Exodus 12 verses 33 through 41. Exodus chapter 12, verses 33 through 41. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up in the clothes on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have the request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, along with flocks and herds, a very large number of livestock. They baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread. For it had not become leaven since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years to the very day, all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Starting up in verse 33, the Egyptian people, they get in on this. Pharaoh demands that they leave, and the people basically say, yes, you need to go. Everybody's encouraging the Israelites to get out. I mean, every Egyptian family has been touched by this simultaneously at midnight. Everybody loses their firstborn. And word quickly gets around that the God of Moses is responsible for this. This happened because Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. And so now everybody is terrified. What's next? I mean, we could all die as a result of this. So the Israelites need to get out immediately, otherwise we will all be dead. So the Israelites then, they leave. It seems like they're in the middle of preparing their unleavened bread. The timing is perfect. And so they leave with the dough in their kneading bowls. I mean, maybe we can imagine leaving our house in an emergency while we're in the middle of cooking something. Um, we just grab what we can. That's the, the food that's there on the countertop. We grab it, we run out the door. 
that's what happens here. Thankfully, God had prepared them for this. They didn't know when it would happen exactly. They didn't know exactly how serious this would be. But unleavened bread is on the menu tonight. And so they just grab the dough and they go. Um, in verses 35 and 36, we find the Israelites, thankfully, had obeyed the Lord beforehand, asking their neighbors for gold and silver. I mean, that was kind of cool, wasn't it? That they obeyed the Lord. If they had kind of blown the Lord off on that, they'd be leaving empty-handed. I know today we have the classic scenario, um, you know, where neighbors will go next door to ask for a cup of sugar. I don't know if I've ever gone next door to ask for a cup of sugar. I, if I have, I don't remember that. Maybe you've done something like that. Maybe you've answered one of those requests. But we know the concept. But here, God's people, slaves, are to ask their neighbors, um, Hey, could I please have all of your silver and gold? And their Egyptian neighbors willingly gave it up. God kind of had a, a role in that. So, hey, can I have all your silver and gold? Well, sure, take all of our precious metals. And now the Israelites are being driven out after having just been given all of this precious metal. And so they leave with dough. I could say, and with dough. But the silver, gold, are just tons of uh, precious metals. And so here Moses explains, thus they plundered the Egyptians. So a few chapters back, you may remember, we learned that the Israelites had favor in the eyes of the people. And so the Egyptians felt sorry for them. I mean, these people are being treated inhumanely. This is awful what our leaders are doing. So here, take it. Take all of our silver and gold. And so as I see it, this is repayment for the centuries of slavery. Basically, these people will need to build a gold-covered tabernacle out in the wilderness in the coming months. And they don't have anything. They're slaves. They have no materials for doing that. But God sees this coming. He prepares them for it. God is looking ahead, and he is providing what they need even before they know that they need it. In verse 37, we have the first indication of the size of this group. I don't think we've had this notation before. We find here that they have around 600,000 men on foot, uh, not counting the children. Uh, we don't have a reference to women here. We don't have a reference to men who were not on foot. I don't know if that's an important distinction, if some were on animals or something uh, to that effect. Uh, so we don't have the women included, it seems. We don't have children included. So if you've got roughly 600,000 men uh, on foot, roughly how large of a group are we talking about? I mean, I'll leave that up to you. We're, we're not given an exact figure. We could estimate, in my mind, we're dealing with a group very roughly between two to three million people. And that's just a guess. I mean, but it is a huge group. If you've got 600,000 men, not including uh, women and children, then you add in the women and children, you're at roughly two to three million people. So I think we certainly understand why Pharaoh was so concerned about losing all of this uh, free slave labor. Um, this was a huge loss to the nation, something that he was really not willing to let go. And now we understand why he fought so valiantly to keep that from happening. We also find they finish cooking the unleavened bread along the way, apparently at their first stop. We also learn at the end of this passage that God's people lived in Egypt for 430 years to the day. It started well, of course, Joseph bringing his dad, his brothers, their families down from the promised land during a famine as they get the best of the land, a place of honor, um, out of Pharaoh's tremendous respect for Joseph. But that quickly deteriorates into hundreds of years of slavery. And now they're finally at least heading back in the direction of the promised land. Well, let's conclude tonight with Exodus chapter 12, verses 42 through 51. Exodus 12, 42 through 51. It is a night to be observed for the Lord, for having brought them out from the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord, to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. But every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near to celebrate it, and he shall be like a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. Then all the sons of Israel did so. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. 
And on that same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Well, in the last paragraph here in chapter 12, God basically clarifies. He gives a few more guidelines concerning who must celebrate the Passover and who is not allowed. It's basically for the Israelites. Foreigners are specifically excluded. We also have a new detail, I think, at the end of verse 46, where we find that as they prepare the lamb, they are not to break any of its bones. Well, that's kind of a random, strange reference, isn't it? Well, it is until we come to John chapter 19, verses 31 through 36, where John says this, Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. For these things came to pass, to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. So during the Passover, as Jesus is on the cross that weekend, the soldiers do not break Jesus' legs as they broke the legs of the other two men. And in this process, they end up fulfilling prophecy. Jesus, as our Passover lamb, doesn't have any of his bones broken as he offers himself as a sacrifice for us. Now, the soldiers, of course, they aren't using Exodus 12 as a manual for how to sacrifice a lamb or anything, are they? They're Romans. They don't care. They don't care about breaking people's bones on the cross. But this is the way that God has arranged it. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice from beginning to end, even in the smallest of details. Well, toward the end here, we have some clarification as to who can participate in the Passover meal going forward. Again, I think we've seen this in the same paragraph. Um, you know, only Israelites. If a foreigner wants in on it, uh, his people and must be circumcised. They must basically become Israelites. And at the end of this paragraph, the people obey, don't they? They listen, they hear the command, they believe what the Lord has said through Moses, and they obey. They do what God has commanded them to do, and God brings them out of the land of Egypt. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 12. And uh, this Sunday, Caleb is leading us again through a study of kind of random characters from the gospel accounts. I think uh, gospel personages is uh, the way they word it. I've never, I don't think I've ever heard that word used by a normal person in my life, but uh, gospel personages. It's kind of a random study here, and uh, then we'll wrap up our study of Hebrews chapter 11 in the worship assembly. Uh, I'll be heading out of town this coming Sunday, Lord willing, right after worship. I'll be heading for Denver for the first week, or at least Colorado, doing some camping there in the mountains, getting ready for the Bear Valley Bible Lectures. And then I'll be heading up to Washington State via California this time. Uh, some things out there I haven't seen I'd love to see, so uh, I will not be here for the next three Wednesday classes, but we're going to continue in our series of lessons from Bible Land's passages with the uh, next three lessons. I put these on there. If you're joining us only on YouTube, you can look this up yourself. These are the next three that we're doing. If you just look up Bible Land passages in quotes and look for passage 9, passage 10, passage 11, I think you'll find these with uh, very little effort. Um, we've done this on and off for a year or two now, but whenever I've been out of town, we'll send out the links via email and the Facebook live stream group. So if you only get your notification for this class through YouTube itself, since you've subscribed to the YouTube channel, uh, you will not get notified for the next three weeks. We have no way of doing that. We can't run these videos on our channel. They don't allow that. So if you're worried you might miss class, let me know. I can put you on the distribution email list or send it to you individually or you can just check the uh, private live stream group for the Four Lakes congregation if you have access to that. So all kinds of ways to find this. I put the screenshots up here on the screen just to give you a bit of a preview but uh, I hope we can stay in the habit of um, getting together studying on Wednesday evening by uh, taking some time to look at some lessons that were filmed in some of the places that they're talking about and some of those places that we read about in the Bible. Again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something that we can do to encourage you, something we need to be praying about, get in touch. 
Uh, send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. Send a text, give a call to 608-224-0274, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God above all others. You are the one and only. You are the deliverer of your people. We've seen that tonight. We know that you also deliver us from the slavery of sin through the blood of your Son, our Passover lamb. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, who gave his life for us on the cross. Amen.